All right, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to CSD 8250. Hopefully I'm in the right room and so are you. I've had my schedule, schedule change the day before I teach. That's why I was, you know, hope I'm in the right place the first day. Um, so as you're used to by now, the first little bit of the first lecture is you know, about the course and that kind of stuff. We'll get that out of the way nice and quick because uh, the first lecture is a little beefy and I usually end up breaking it up because people's brains start leaking out of their ears. Um, so, okay. Is that legible size-wise? Okay. Um, I mean, I've never been in this room before and I didn't realize these are high resolution projectors. So everything stayed a bit smaller than I expected. All right. So I graduated from Canada College in 1996. Uh, for those of you that don't know where that is, that's up in North Bay, about four hours north of here. Um, graduated with a computer programmer analyst diploma. Yeah. Hey, I will try to project as best I can. Um, so as I just said, I graduated in 96 uh, from a computer programmer analyst diploma. Uh, it had a focus in business systems. Not important to you guys. That's just where I come from. I don't have fancy letters after my name. I'm a college graduate, like you guys all hope to be. Um, I've been working as a professional developer ever since. Well, actually, until yesterday. Um, I'll explain what that is. And my slides aren't up to date. Anyways, I just realized my I updated them and they didn't sync. Um, so I work full time and teach part time. It means that my skill set's current, like very current. So ignore the line that I work for Catholic Technology. Um, I quit about four months ago. I'm currently working for Health Canada as a team lead. Um, I'm a part of their. Uh, Business Intelligence and Data Analytics Department. So I deal with data, which is apropos for this course. Um, what kind of person am I? Um, I tend to have a, least, a loose and easygoing teaching style. I tend to be um, very informal. I've been told I'm sometimes sarcastic. Uh, that's never happened at all. Uh, I tend to understand that life happens. Even before COVID, I understood life happened, happens, and now it happens even more. Uh, by that token, I also don't tend to suffer fools. That's an old expression. Essentially, if your dog peed on your laptop four weeks in a row and you can't do your work, that's your problem. That you're making my problem. I don't put up with that. Uh, I'm going to treat you guys like adults. I expect you guys to behave like adults. Actually, overall, the age group in this here is pretty decent. Um, so I'm not going to hunt you down. I expect you to be responsible for your own stuff. If, you know, you can't manage your own life and it's affecting your schoolwork, you know, things are going to have to be dealt with. Um, I've been told I'm an equal opportunity offender. Uh, I've been known to roast my students in class. If you're being dumb, I'll call you out on it. Um, people have said there's no such thing as a stupid question. Yes, there's such a thing as a stupid question. There's no such thing as a dumb question. It's two different things. Dumb is something you're born. Stupid is something you choose to be. Don't be stupid. So if you're being extra, expect to be picked on in a nice way. And, you know, I don't care who you are. Everybody gets it at some point or other. Um, if you don't like something I said to you, feel free to tell, call me out on it, either in class or after class, and I'll make sure not to do that again. Uh, I've been teaching for 17 years. I've gotten pretty good at guessing what I shouldn't say in front of a group of people. And I still manage to offend people. Uh, uh -huh. But that's okay. Um, yeah, I'm not PC, so it is what it is. Okay, uh, best practices, attendance. 
attend lectures and the labs. Um, I'm actually going to put a caveat on the whole attendance thing. Uh, some of you have noticed I'm wearing a microphone. Some other people that might have noticed I put up a little camera up front. I record my lectures. Uh, I don't do it because I'm supposed to. I do it because I want to. Um, technically, I'm not supposed to anymore, but I still do it anyways. Uh, the lectures get posted on YouTube. So if you are sick, don't make the rest of us sick. Go home. Stay home. They're usually the lectures up the same day. So odds are by class will be over at 6. Get home at 6.30. Yeah, about 7.30, 8 o'clock tonight. Uh, depending if I'm eating supper or not first, uh, the lecture will be up on YouTube. Um, so if you're sick and this is your last class of the day, don't, don't be here, mate. Don't, don't be here snotting on people sitting next to you. That's just not cool. Um, the course moves quickly. Missing a lecture can lead to being lost in the course. Again, I record my lectures, so it's not the end of the world if you're sick. Um, so in other words, if you can't attend because you are sick, watch the recording so you don't fall behind. Uh, essentially, the way this course is set up is every lecture is a self-contained topic. Like we do lecture one, a little bit of carry over to lecture two, a little bit of carry forward to lecture three. But essentially, each lecture is self-contained. It doesn't have anything extra past that. Um, so that's why it says, you know, it's dangerous to miss a lecture, or at least watch the recording. Um, and again, I make no promises on the recording. There's always a risk that I'll have a hardware malfunction of some sort. It's happened in the past, thinking of that. Okay. That's happened, I forgot to turn on my microphone. Um, if things happen and you get sick or whatever, your car breaks down, the train decides not to show up for the, you know, unsurprising hundredth time, or paratransit, or OC transport just drives past you, even though the bus is empty, um, cool, email me. It's fine. Um. All the course material is on Brightspace. So there's no textbooks. Everything you need is on Brightspace. Slides are there. There's recommended reading every week. They're like short little five to 10 page jobs. Um, I don't know what textbook they're talking about. So I inherited somebody else's slides. And every time I say, I got to get rid of that. But there's, instead of a single textbook, there's a bunch of smaller chapters that are in there. So it's good. Um, I will be putting up weekly announcements that says, this is what you should be reading. This is what you should be doing. This is when things are due. There's no mysteries in my class. All right. Labs are due by the end of the following week. That's to make sure that everybody has an equivalent amount of time for the labs. That's where I say, be thankful you're not in computer programmer, computer program analyst, or CET, or CET, because they've got some new weird structure in there where half the lab is due by the end of the lab period. And if you don't do it, you get a zero. Uh, so you fun time teaching one of those classes. Um, so you literally have two weeks to do these labs. If you are more than if you're late, but I mean, if you're an hour late, I don't care. But if you're like three days late, you're going to take a 20% deduction off the top. At the end of the week, you make it very easy for me. I'm at a zero. Um, uh, I don't need to say the labs are a great way to test your learning, but it's a good way to test it. Um, don't be shy to ask questions. I will answer questions in class. It's never a big issue. Um, okay, so that having been said, all the labs are submitted online. 
the good news for you guys is I've also got all your lab sections. So it's me for everything. On Brightspace, which I'll give you guys a quick tour, I've posted the times for the lab sections. If for some reason one doesn't work and you need help, you can come to one of the others. I don't take attendance in lab. If you don't need help and you don't feel like coming to class because you're, I don't know, you might want to make sure your gacha rolls run out just right or, you know, you're trying to uh, improve your APMs for the day, that's fine. Don't come to class. Just submit your work. Like I said, I'm going to treat you guys like adults. Yeah. Yep. I'm going to get to that in a minute. But, yeah. Because um, I'm going to talk about how the schedule works out now. So, if the course broke down as follows. Uh, I'm going to dive into uh, the introduction of data modeling and database design today. Uh, we're going to talk about diagramming next week. Uh, normalization, which is probably the worst topic of the semester during week three. Um, we're going to talk about the database design process in week four. Indexes and views. After that, week six, we're going to have a midterm review. Week seven, we're going to have the midterm right here. Notice it says midterm. There's only one. Because of the nature of the material for this course, there is no way for me to do a, pra a practical exam. You'd have to all sit there and rapidly normalize and diagram and do a bunch of stuff that really is not something you should be rushing. Um, years and years ago in this course, when I had this course like eight years ago, I tried it once. It never happened again. I basically threw out the results and just gave everybody 100%. Uh, because it was such a mixed bag of trash that half the I think over two-thirds of the students failed it because they were rushed. And this is not a top, it's not a concept you should be rushing to do. Um, this is not a program comp programming competition. And not everybody's brains work with database design the same way at the same speed. Some people are fast. Some people are slow. Just because you're fast doesn't mean you're good. Just because you're slow doesn't mean you're bad. It's just the speed you design at. Then we have a study break. Yay. That's the week I spend playing video games. Yay. Um, or trying to catch on my backlog is more ap appropriate. Um, week nine, we're going to be doing database backups and restore, uh, diving then into security. Uh, then we do triggers and stored procedures and functions. Often, those two lectures end up getting condensed into week 11 um, because realistically, the two topics are very, very similar and it's just easier to do all in one go than to break it up over two weeks. Um, then we talk about transactions. And then we have the final review. Then we have our final exam, wherever they're going to book it on whatever day, at whatever time, which is not going to be like a normal schedule, uh, we'll have the final exam. Uh, the fact that I mentioned that week 11 and 12 sometimes get combined as a single lecture, sometimes I end up with an empty week at the end. And you guys get an empty week, which is good, because you're probably getting buried in other classes. Uh, I make no promises, though, because who knows with the weather, people's health, whatever. Okay, so 10 labs. They're each worth 5% of your grade. So skipping a lab is not conducive to getting a good grade. Um, the midterm is 20% and your final exam is 30%. You will notice there's no assignments because this class does not have assignments. There's no hybrids even though technically it's a hybrid course. Uh, years ago, they decided to take out the hybrids and nobody put them back in. 
And I, it's just one extra hour you guys don't need to worry about every week. 50%. Well, 50.01%. We're beat technical. Um, I also am the, I'm also a person that ceilings his grades. I don't know if you know what that means. Um, okay. You guys know what integers are, right? Yeah. Okay. You know how rounding works? Okay. Now the difference is when you floor, you're truncating a, a number, you get rid of the decimal places. You bring it to the lowest, next lowest number. When you're ceiling, it takes and goes to the next number up. So even if it's 50.1, it'll turn into a 51. Why? It saves me grief. From people going, I got a 49.2. Can you round it? Up? I mean, I got a, an 89.2. Can you round that up to a 90 so I can get an A plus? I'm like, years ago, I said, fuck it. I'm done. There's a lack of political correctness for you. Um, I'm done. I ceiling my grades. Uh, everybody basically gets an automatic roundup to the next number grade. Therefore, nobody gets to ask for, please, can you round up my grade? Uh, essentially, what you see on Brightspace is what you're going to get plus whatever the next number up is. Unless you're dead on like 80. Like if you're like literally 80.0, it's not going anywhere because I got nothing to round up from. But it would only go to 81 anyways. It wouldn't make a difference. Okay, so this is a 3-2-4 class. Um, three hours of theory. Supposedly one hour online. There isn't. But technically there is. Uh, two hours of lab. And trust me, most labs are done well under two hours. Except maybe the normalization lab. Uh, some people get through that really fast. Some people do not. Remember earlier I said some people are fast and some people aren't fast? That's one of the labs where people are fast or not. Um, four hours of study time. They expect you guys to dedicate up to four hours of study time for this class. It's up to you. If you want to do four hours, great. If you want to do 45 minutes, great. I don't care. It's your grade. Okay. Any questions about the course before I actually dive into this week's material? I can't have students' faces show up on the internet without their written permission. So I have to block the camera when somebody crosses behind me. Okay. Um, as I was saying, does anybody have any questions um, for me before I continue onwards. Okay. So there's going to be a quick review on the concept of keys. Do you guys took learned about those last semester? I hope. Um, some semesters, people have come in, I've said, you've learned about keys. They go, yeah. I've had some semesters, I say, you've learned about keys. They go, no. Some people uh, say, I wasn't even awake for the class at all. So we're going to do a quick review on concept of keys. And then we are going to dive into the important part. Um, I've been known to split this particular lecture into two pieces anyways, because the first week is back is rough for everybody. Um, all right, keys. <clears throat> so we must have the ability to uniquely identify each row of a table. We do that by creating keys. Uh, this ensures that no row in a table can have exactly the same values for all attributes. Um, that's a really terrible way of saying that it makes sure the entire row is unique. If a row, if the rows in the database are not unique, it becomes very difficult to actually query your data. Um, SQL does not know what you want. And SQL is not smart enough, any database engine is not smart enough to say, hey, I see the same row four times. I wonder which one he wants to edit now. It can't 
No. So we need to have primary keys. On that little example, uh, it shows the SIN number and the name. So the unique rows means we can count the items in the table properly. In this case, we'd be able to find it, the unique people based on their SIN numbers. Um, by the way, never use a SIN number as a primary key. Just it was used as a quick example. Um, even better tip, never put a SIN number in a database unless you have to. It's uh, not a good thing to have compromised. Out of all the things you can put in there. And for those of you that don't know what a SIN number is, it's Canada's social insurance number. Uh, so in the U.S. it's called the social security number. And uh, England calls it something else. And every country has a magic number. This is who you are. Here's your number. Um, that's what identifies you as the government. Really never put that in a database if you can help it. Um, yeah. All right. So what could happen if we don't uniquely identify the rows? Data is duplicated. Uh, we couldn't count rows properly. Good chance we can't get meaningful data out of the database. Um, integrity, quality, accuracy, and reliability would be compromised. If you cannot uniquely identify a row of data, how can you know it's the correct row of data? And if you don't know it's correct, therefore, are you sure your data, your data's integrity is correct? Who knows? Is it accurate? Who knows? Um, reliability. Is going to go south. So the main role of keys is to A, make the rows unique, B, to allow us to form relationships. Um, writing queries would be really difficult and complex. The where clause would be insane if you didn't have primary keys to look up records. So keys are good. So there's couple of different kinds of keys that we're going to worry about in this course. We have the primary key. So it's one or more columns, or also known as attributes, that make uniquely identify each row in a database. Um, as a rule of thumb, you want to make your primary key single columned. It's better that way, um, but you need to have one. Foreign key. A foreign key is a primary key from another table that is used to uh, form a relationship. We're going to talk about those later in the term. Uh, but I think, you know, the term foreign key should not be a mystery to you. Does that ring a bell to anybody in this room? Okay, we got a couple of thumbs up. All right. Um, composite key. Uh, anytime a key, and it's just not necessarily a primary key, anytime a key is made up of more than one column, it's known as a composite key. A composite key can be a foreign key. It can be a primary key. In theory, it could be a primary and a foreign key at the same time, uh, made up of multiple columns. The second you got multiple columns, it's a composite key. And then you usually have to qualify it as in it's a composite primary key or a composite foreign key or a composite primary foreign key. Uh, those are not cool. Um, the terms are not exclusive. A key, so that's what the node is saying. The a given key can fit the criteria of any and all of these different terms. So take your pick. So a primary key, one or many columns that uniquely identify each row. Um, a properly modern design database. Notice I'm, I'm putting an emphasis on the word modern. Usually uses numbers. Um, and it uses something called a sequence. Um, different database engines implement sequences differently. MySQL has something called, uh, MySQL and MariaDB have something called auto increment as an attribute of a column. Uh, Postgres has something called an ident identity type column or serial data type. Oracle has none of the above. You have an integer with something called a sequence. Uh, Microsoft has SQL Server gives you three different ways to do it. And they're all a little different from each other. It just depends what you need to do. Uh, IBM DB2 also uses sequences. So depending what engine you're using, 
the tool to generate these is different, but in the end, it's all the same thing. How many of you have been somewhere in the last six months where you had to take a number? Take a number. This is your number. You wait till your number is called. Can anybody else use that number after you have it? That's how sequences work in the database. It takes the number. It's yours forever. It, that has performance issues. Um, so a UUID, because you're thinking of a uni universally unique identifier, right? UUID. They're, what, 32 characters to 48 characters long, alphanumeric? Those are pigs to index. A number is easy to index because we will talk about indexes later in the term, but it's a lot easier to take a group of numbers and divide it to search for things. Um, usually when we talk about numbers and that kind of thing for indexes or for uh, keys, I like to use the guess a number between 1 and 10. So if you guess a number between 1 and 10, what's their first guess should be every time? Okay, if I say lower, what's your next guess supposed to be? If I say lower, what's your next guess going to be? 1 or 2, because you got a 55th chance of getting it right. You can play the same game with 1 to 100, and you'd only need one extra guess if you follow that technique. Because it's numbers, if you're using strings, you can't do the divide. When UIDs and GUI IDs, are like goods, which is what Microsoft SQL Server can use, have the same issue. You can't divide them. Um, yeah, it's possible to use other values as long as they're guaranteed to be unique. So again, the UUID can be unique because it's universally unique, theoretically. Um, a primary cannot be null, and it must be unique. Uh, by default, the second you create a column as a primary key, it can never be null. It won't let you. Um, so we use an auto-generated ID when none of the attributes in the table are suitable as the primary key. Realistically, in modern database systems, notice I'm saying modern, we tend to not use the attributes of the entity we create a surrogate key with an integer because it's faster and it's always guaranteed to be unique. Um, it's gotten to the point where certain things that we used to take for granted were safe or no longer safe. SID numbers, for example. I'm not going to ask if anybody here has ever had their identity stolen, but one of the first things you're supposed to do is get a new SID number. SID number can change. How many people here have had more than one phone number their entire life? Okay, that's going to be almost everybody in this room, maybe except for a few that still live at home with their parents and don't own a cell phone, right? Phone numbers change. How many of you have had more than one email or currently have more than one email address? Okay, is that unique? Guaranteed to stay unique and never change? Now, if I give you the number five, that's your number for the rest of your life, five. Nobody else ever gets to be number five. It's great. It's never going to change. Therefore, we tend to use auto-generated primary keys. That's just design decisions. Foreign keys. A foreign key is a primary key from another table that's used to form a relationship through the keys. It does not follow the rules of the primary key. It doesn't have to be unique. It doesn't have to be null. It can be null. But it doesn't have to be not null. So it doesn't have to be unique. It doesn't have to be any of those rules. It can be whatever it wants. A foreign key can be part of the primary key of the new table or not. It depends if it's a weak entity or not. Um, if a foreign key becomes part of the primary key, then it cannot be nullable anymore. It must allow, it must be not null. Um, so Foreign keys can be multiple columns. And foreign keys are designed to uniquely identify rows in another table from one table to the other. Um, there's something in here that I, I remembered I needed to say and I can't, I lost it. Gone. 
if it comes back, I'll get, I'll loop back to it. Um, yeah. Composite keys, uh, I already talked about that. That's when it's a key made up of more than one column. It uses existing columns instead of an auto-generated ID. Theoretically, you could save some resources. Theoretically. But realistically, you're going to actually lose resources elsewhere with more complex queries, more complex indexes, potentially more complex programming for the developers. <clears throat> so if we want to use a composite key, you have to have a really good reason to use it. Uh, the reason why we still teach the concept of composite keys is when you leave school, the real world is not a nice place. You will inherit databases that are crap, that were designed 40 years ago. Or maybe you're working with unstructured data that you have to use composite keys. Uh, I just helped with a project at work. Uh, I can't give much of the details, but we're ingesting uh, close to a gigabyte of data every three days. The primary key is 12 columns because that's the format it comes in. End of story. Composite keys will exist. They happen. You need to know what they are. If you can avoid them, please do so. That's essentially what that message is. Okay. This is a comp, yep. Yeah. Well, you can have a compound primary key, but you can never have two primary keys. You can have a primary key made up of more than one thing, but it's still one primary key. You cannot have two primary keys because then which one's the one that makes it unique? Do you understand what I'm saying? So you can define a compound primary key, yes, but you can only ever have one primary key. Whether the primary key is made up of one item or multiple items, Makes no difference. There's one primary key. You can have n foreign keys. You can have as many foreign keys as you want. You can only ever have one true primary key. Okay. So this example is showing a compound key. Um, student class list. It assumes that there's probably a student's table and a course ID table, a course table. And it's inheriting the student ID and the course ID. Those are both part of the primary key. And it's a compound key because there's two pieces to it. It's still one primary key, but it's made up of two pieces. <clears throat> um, here's another quick example. You got a customer, primary key, nice and clean. It's a customer number. You have an order, which has an order ID. And for some unknown reason, somebody decided, and by the way, this is a really stupid design. Um, but somewhere along the way, somebody decided to create a compound key on the order by including the customer ID as part of the primary key. So order ID is part of the primary key. Customer ID is also part of the primary key, but it's also a foreign key. So this example is an everything in one example shows you a single primary key a compound primary key a foreign key that happens to participate as part of the primary key that slide really just shows you that keys are very malleable in the sense of you can do whatever you need to do for the job as long as it makes sense um, personally i would have had the order id as the primary key Customer ID as a foreign key, but not part of the primary key, but make customer ID mandatory anyways, so it can't be null. That way, the primary key of order, the order table is simpler to work with, but we're still managing the same amount of uh, referential integrity. So we're maintaining the integrity of the data without uh, making things more complicated than they need to be. Because when we look at the structure, You'll, there's no way for a single table to have an order by more than one person. Can you imagine you place an order on Amazon and your roommate gets the same order and you can both put shit in the order at the same time in one order and he can take your stuff out 
and, you know, she can put her stuff in and, you know, suddenly there's a war over an order. That's not how it works in the real world. You go to Loblaws, it's not three people checking out. It's one person checking out. Even if there's six of you buying chips, it's one person going through checkout. So it's one receipt, one order. Amazon's the same way. Tea Turtle's the same way. Steam's the same way. That's just how it is. Um, so personally, I'd skip the primary key on that, but that's cool. Okay. That was the review to keys. And I bet you I covered all kinds of new material you've never seen before while talking about keys. Um, we will actually talk about keys again. So just, that was just make sure we're all on the same page of what we understood what keys are for. Okay. Uh, database table. Hang on. We've played with database tables last semester, I hope. If you're doing SQL, I sure as heck hope you're playing with tables. Um, all tables normally have the following things. A name. It's hard to query a table if you don't know what it's called. The database server will also not know what it, the data is called if you don't give it a name. So all tables have a name. Columns are identified by a name of their own. In this case, we got sin and name. Uh, rows are identified by a set of columns. Uh, they have a primary key. If it's a properly made table, uh, primary key is used to uniquely identify the single row of data. Um, the little table on the left is the structure of the table. The little table on the right is data in the structure of the table. Uh, this is stuff that should be somewhat familiar after taking level one database with uh, basic SQL. Um, Here's a few pro tips. One, table names must be unique to the database. You can't have the same thing with the same name in the same database. You can't have, you can't have two things with the same name in the same database. So if you have a person table, you can never have a second person table. You gotta give it another name. Person two, person underscore two, person B, whatever you want to call it but it cannot be the same name. Column names are unique to the table, not to the database. So you could have a column called name in every table in your database, but you can't have the column name twice in the same table. Same idea as the table. Table is unique to the database. Field names are unique to the table, are unique to the table. So, you know, each level of scope has uniqueness. Um, Years and years ago, there was database systems where columns had to be unique. It was terrible. But it was just how things were. You just lived with it. All right. So now we had a quick refresher on what a table is. Now we're going to actually talk about the design concepts. We have three definitions up on screen. Entity. An entity is a person, a place, an object, an event, or a concept in the environment about which an organization wishes to maintain data. Here at the college, we have tons of entities we can talk about. We have students. We have courses. We have classrooms. We have faculty. We have programs. These are all entities. They're things we want to keep track of. You leave the school, we have other kinds of things that keep track of. The CRE keeps track of your taxes. They care what you made, how much you paid, and whether you paid enough. The hospitals care about your how OHIP card to know if you can be treated, that kind of stuff. Different organizations will have different data they worry about. Identity type. It's a collection of entities that share common properties or of characteristics. So the phrase entity and entity type can be used interchangeably. Usually we just use entity, but occasionally you'll see the words entity type depending on where you work because they just learned it a little different. 
But an entity, an entity type is the same thing. It's something we want to keep track of. And they all share common attributes. So if we want to talk about a student entity, that's one you guys should all understand. What are some of the attributes of a, which we're going to be talking about attributes in a second, but student ed entities have attributes. They have a name. They have a student number. They have an email address. Those are an entity or an entity type. It's what defines the entity. The instance is a single occurrence of said entity type. So you're an instance, you're an instance, they're instances. The one that's yawning probably is not an instance because he's not here. I'm kidding. It's good. I warned people it was going to happen. You became an instance the second you paid attention to me. <laughs> so... It's a identity instance is a single occurrence of the same attributes spread out. So in other words, you all share the same attributes to the school. The values are different for each of you, but you all have the same attributes. That's what an instance is. It's a collection of all the things that make up an entity item by item by item. So. An entity is a shortened word to use to refer to an entity type. Type is a person. An instance would be John Doe. Cool. Attributes. Attributes is a property. An attribute is a characteristic or a property of an entity. It helps you describe the entity. Often, when you're seeing the descriptions, you'll see them as nouns. All attributes have values unless they can be null. But essentially, the concept of null is actually a value in this case. So going back to my example of students, student number, first name, last name, phone number, email, mailing address, current living address, because it could be different, technically. You know, you're living in residence, but your mailing address is in Chatham, Ontario. Because that's where you're from and you don't have a permanent address in Ottawa. Each of you will have a unique version of each of these attributes. You might have two people with the same name, but they won't have the same phone number or the same email address. The collection together makes up a entity instance based on those attributes. The last one says all attributes have values. This is an interesting concept. Uh, it's pretty unique to the world of database when we say all attributes have our values. They all have a value, yes. Even when there's a lack of value, that's considered a value. In other words, you have a cell phone number, but you don't have a home phone number because it's becoming more and more common where people have a cell phone number, but they don't have a landline number. They just don't have one anymore because why pay Bell or Rogers twice for the same thing? Or insert company here, depending on where you're from. So you'll end up with a situation where a person's home phone number might be empty. Therefore, technically that's a value. It doesn't have a number. A properly designed database will actually have it as a null instead of an empty. You guys know what a null is, right? I've had years where I've asked, you know what a null is? And people are like, I don't know what a null is. In database, nulls have a special place. It means I don't know. Technically, I don't know is a value. Which until now, you've learned that nulls are an absence of value. Correct? You've defined a space. Its current value is null, which is technically impossible because null is the absence of value. But in a database, when something is null, it is, I don't know, or we don't know, or we don't have this data. Therefore, technically, it's a value because you don't know. You have a question? Is the absence of value equal to the absence of value? 
Technically, you can't compare nulls. Null equal to null. Is that true or false? I don't know. I'd have actually have to try it. Because different database servers will implement that slightly differently. Uh, I know most database servers, it's impossible for something to be equal to null. I mean, like you search for... Yes, in Python, you can do that. In Java, you can do that. But in SQL, you cannot say is where field is, e is equal to null. It's impossible. It won't let you. Does somebody know why? I usually teach this in my SQL classes, but, you know, does anybody know why? Oh, yeah, the syntax is different, but why? Somebody was actually doing a smart in the 70s when they came up with this. Yes. Well, technically, nulls are the same thing by not by being nothing. Okay, if this is the absence of value, can something be equal to the absence of value? It is either null or it is not null. It, it can't be equal to something. It's either it is or it is not null. Yeah. It cannot be equal to null because null is absence of value. You can't be equal to something that doesn't exist. So. Yeah, that's just, you know, an SQL moment there. It's a little, side, a little diversion. So all attributes have values, which comes back to this. The fact, technically, in database, null is a value in the sense that you don't know what the value is. So we treat it as being a value conceptually. We don't know, right? We just don't know. Therefore, it's null. Null means I don't know, which is technically a value. I hate nulls. Uh, the concept of nulls is actually one of the hardest concepts for students to wrap their brains around. Because you've got languages like Python or PHP or insert other language here, where you have, you can make, you know, if variable equal null, equal, equal null, do this. Well, that's impossible because technically it can't be equal to null, but programming languages let you do that. Database servers, they were they did the smart thing where they actually treated a null like it's supposed to be treated. It's treated like data. And lack of data is still data. People don't that's something they don't realize. When you're defining a database and their attributes like an entity and its attributes, they'll go, Well, we don't know what this is, but it might show up someday. The fact that you know it might show up is data. It's a placeholder. You don't want to have too many placeholders, but you might need a placeholder. All right. So an attribute is a property characteristic of an entity. Uh, a person can be described by sin and their name. Therefore, when you think about what you learned last semester, where you had tables and columns, a table is an entity, a column is an attribute. So we can do a direct map from what you learned last semester to what you're learning this semester. A column is an attribute, a table is an entity. All right, and then we have relationships. Relationships describe how entities associate with one another. Uh, often we use verbs, and there's three types. One to one, one to many, many to many. Um, so I'm going to describe them because I'm pretty sure there's going to be more slides with this, but I want to cover it now because every semester I forget if I have it later in the slides. Um, so one-to-one -one means you have two entities. They have a one-to-one -one relationship. A good example here at the school, how many of you have lockers? It's winter, so usually I have at least one person. Only one? Holy cow. Anyways, all right, when you sign up for a locker, are you allowed to have more than one locker? Can the locker exist without you? Well, yeah. Well, it's down the hall, right? So the locker is an entity that can exist on its own. You're an entity that can exist without the locker. You're only ever allowed to be assigned to one locker. The locker's only ever allowed to be assigned to one person, technically. You can have multiple people using it, 
But as far as the school is concerned, the locker is responsible for one person. That's a one-to-one -one relationship. One-to-many. That's the most common relationship in database systems. One prof, many students. That's the most visual example I can give you. Um, you'll hear many to one. Sometimes you'll see many to one is the same freaking thing. Many students, one prof. We're just flipping it. And then you got many to many, also known as the Kentucky relationship, where everything is related to everything else. And for those of you that don't get the joke, you ask someone who just chuckled, and they'll explain it to you. I'm just not going to record what that explanation. So many to many is something that's used at the concept level. It can never be translated to physical because it's physically impossible to create a database that supports many to many relationships. There's a technique to convert a many to many into something else that can actually be done. But um, in my years of doing this, and I've been doing this for 26 years, 27 years, 26 years, something like that. It's been a while, 27 years. I've only ever run across one database engine that supported many to many implementation. And it was horrifyingly bad to work with. Um, because you could actually have a, a situation where everything is literally related to everything else. So you delete one row, it's got a cascade to clean up after itself. And you delete one row and you end up deleting 90% of your data because it's just going back and forth, right? So I'll be talking about how to handle many to many in a bit. But realistically, one to many is what you're going to use 95, 98% of the time. One to one is used for, you know, special cases like student and locker, um, employee security badge, student U pass, because you're only ever allowed to have the one U pass. You lose your U pass, you get a new one, the old one dies, it gets deactivated, never to be used again. Uh, so, one to one, the U pass can technically exist without you. You can exist without your U pass, but you only ever have one going in both directions. Okay. So we're going to be using something called crow's foot notation. I'll be addressing that later. Um, but essentially, a professor can have one office, and each office can be assigned to one professor, uh, except at Algonquin. All part time profs share one space, it's a good time. Um, I don't think I've been in a part-time faculty office in four years <laughs> since COVID started. But normally, even at a workplace, you have a desk, you're assigned a desk. That desk is yours. That's it, right? So it's a one-on-one -on -one relationship. All right, so quick review. Entities, an instance is a specific uh, row in a table basically a collection of attributes. Uh, type is, you know, the description that mounts out to a table. Attributes describe the entities. Uh, the relationships basically is a link between entities. All right. So when we're designing entities, there's a few things we have to take into account. An entity should be an object that has many instances in the database. You rarely ever create an entity for one thing. I'm not saying one kind of thing for one thing. And that's a difference. So, um, trying to find a really good real world example. Drawing a blank. So, for example, Parliament Hill, right? So you've got the buildings on Parliament Hill. You could either model it as a series of buildings, but you wouldn't model Parliament Hill. Parliament Hill is one thing. The buildings are multiple things. Parliament Hill is made up of multiple buildings, but you wouldn't model one thing. So you're creating a database for a company. 
you wouldn't, you would almost never, unless it's a multi-company system, create a single entity to describe the company. Why would you do that? You could possibly have a settings table that, you know, where they put in the address and whatnot, but you would never actually create an entity for the company itself. You'd describe what they care about. Like you're doing a database about weather patterns. You're not going to try to model Environment Canada. Because that's a thing, a single thing that you don't need to model. So an entity should have many instances. In other words, we want to model stuff that repeats. Repeats differently, most likely, but repeats. Like each of you are unique students, but you're all students. So we'd model something called students. I wouldn't go out of my way to model a student. You, specifically. I don't care, you. I care what a student is. Don't take it personally. I'm just picking on you now. Right, but that's just it, right? I don't care about the individual student when I'm modeling. I care about what makes up a student. So then I can reuse it for student left, student to the right. It's all good. An object is normally made up of multiple attributes. If the thing only has one thing describing it, you, it's probably not a good target for database design. Like if it's a single attribute, is it really a thing that you would need to worry about? Maybe you could just include it with something else. Um, it should be an object we're trying to model. So we're doing a model about weather patterns. So do we care about how to model furniture? No. So when we're designing, an entity should be something that actually is applicable to whatever it is we're trying to design around. It should not be a user of the database system. And I have to be careful with that one. Yes, you could have users in your database system, as in a table for users. Cool. It's not Debbie. You're not modeling Debbie. You're modeling the people could, that could use it. So you're not modeling a specific user. You're just going to model for all the users. So the sense says a user. Um, you're also not going to model the output. You have data in your database. Cool. You could not give a rat's behind. I'll pull I'll censor that one. A rat's behind as to uh, what happens to the data after it's been put in. Does it come out as a report? Cool. Is it on a form? Cool. Is it being used as spam to bother you? Also cool. Not cool, but cool. That's output. It has nothing to do with the data in the database. It's not something you should model. That having been said, a lot of systems will have tables for reports and tables for email templates and that kind of thing. And that's because they're modeling the concept of a report. What makes up a report? The name of a report the source of the report, frequency of running the report, who has access to the report. That's an entity. The actual report output of the report itself is not. Does that make sense to you? Kind of? Sort of? Right? What comes out is not important. It's what you use to define it is important. Um, which is actually something a lot of new people, like people new to database design, have a hard time with is um, differentiating between what needs to be modeled and what is actually input or output. Essentially, if it's something that comes out of it, you don't care. If it's something coming into it, you care to make sure you can capture it, but you don't care what it is itself, if that makes sense. So, there are two types of entities. Strong and weak. A strong entity has a primary key. It's independent of other entities. Student and locker. The locker can exist without you. You can exist without a locker. 
They're both strong entities. A weak entity is an entity that does not have a primary key or may not have a primary key is a better statement. It might still have its own primary key, but often the primary key is made up of a foreign key. It's dependent on another entity. So the weak entity um, is, and we all know someone like this, we all have that one person that that is only defined by their significant other. Their significant other doesn't exist. They don't exist. Right? They're weak entities because they cannot exist on their own. Okay, I'm just being savage, okay? But but we've all known people like that in our lives. We've all met people. I like using that as an example because that's something we've all witnessed at least once in our lives. And it works with both sides of the equation. It's not just the guy or the girl. Both sides do it. So, Or whatever other applicable combination you want. But realistically, we tend to use, uh, for the weak entity, I like using loan and payment. Um, whoever came up with this slide was actually really good. Uh, most of the other slides are crap, but actually I like this one. Um, because it's something that most people will understand. Okay, a loan can exist without anything else. You get a loan. Fantastic. The loan exists. It's a thing. It's strong. It can exist on its own. It can be uniquely identified such as with a primary key. A payment is a weak entity because we can't make a payment to a loan unless it exi a loan exists. Imagine if you walked into a bank and you go, Take my money. I'm making a payment on a loan. They go, what loan? I don't know. Just pay a loan. They'll laugh you out of the bank. Because you have a payment with nothing to apply it to. Therefore, the payment cannot exist because it doesn't have something to pay against. Therefore, a loan is a strong entity. The payment is a weak entity. An order is the same thing. A customer can exist without an order. The order cannot exist unless the customer places it. A customer, an order only exists with a receiving customer. It's fairly straightforward, but the loan and payment's the best one. All right, we're going to talk about attributes. Five o'clock, doing pretty good. Um, so attributes are a little more complicated than entities, even though so far entities is fairly a straightforward concept. Talk about attributes, and they're fairly straightforward in general, but they have a little more nuance to them. So, when we talk about attributes, there's a couple of different classifications uh, required versus optional. So, a required attribute is something that the entity instance cannot exist without. Here at the school, can you exist in the system without your student number? No. Can you exist without a last name? Yes. Because if you're from India, you may not have a last name. It's just how it is. There's other countries like that, but India is usually my go-to for that one because I've had so many students where their last name's a period because the system had to have something in there, so their last name's a period. It, it is what it is. But the first name is required. Usually, email address is required. You must have an email address nowadays in the system. So that's required versus optional. Simple versus composite. Simple is a uh, attribute made up of a single atomic value. Date of birth. I'm pretty sure everybody in this room only has one date of birth, and it doesn't change. On the other hand, a composite attribute is an attribute made up of multiple pieces. The easiest one I use for people to understand is address. I go, what's your address? What are the parts you're going to list off when you list off your address? Street number, street name, city, province, state, regional division of some sort, 
A postal code in most countries, a country, depending on what kind of address you're asking for. All those things put together make up an address. But often as humans, we say, what's your address? We break that down in the computer, but at the design stage, that's known as a composite attribute. It's an attribute made up of multiple pieces. Yep. Depends. If you want to break it down by day, month, year, yes. But as far as most database systems are concerned, a date is a date. Uh, very rarely are you required to break down a date. And if you need to break it down, the database server has special tools built into it to break it down. So for example, you feed a date into, the, into a database server, it knows what the year, the month, and the day is. It doesn't need to think about what those are. If you feed it an address, what delineates each piece of the address? The database server has no way to know. What, so that's why it's a composite, because how many people here have a composite street address? By that I go, okay, 1317 Carling Avenue, unit 807. That's a, compos that's a composite street address. 1317 Carling, apartment 807. Often you'll write that as two separate lines. So you have a composite street address, but not everybody has that. So in the database server, how is it supposed to know what those are? So at the design stage, cool, it's an address. When we convert that to a physical diagram, it's going to be broken out to its component pieces. So we break up the composite by its component pieces. We have single-valued versus multi-valued attributes. Back to the date of, uh, date of birth. That's a single-valued attribute. Like I said before, does anybody in here have more, one, more than one date of birth? No. And if you do, I really need to see your birth certificate. Because I've never seen that before in my life. Um, it's possible if you believe or if the hospital screws up. You still only have one date of birth. February 29th. So you could be, for everything is concerned, odds are your birthday celebrated on the 28th for most people when it's on leap year. Or March 1st, depending what their systems are like. Very few systems handle leap years properly when it comes to date of birth. Those are the fun edge case. But yeah, it's, a good, it's, a worth, it's worth bringing it up. On the other hand, a multi-valued attribute is an attribute made up of a list. Not multiple pieces, a list of similar things. Skills is a good example of a multi-valued attribute. I go, hey, I have an employee. They have these skills. And at the design stage, we might have kept it as a multi-valued attribute. Dude can SQL. Dude can PHP. They can Python. They know how to use Fabric, Microsoft Fabric, you know. They've used some other database product. Those are skills they have. At the design stage, we might treat that as a single thing, skills. So that's known as a multi-valued, where a single attribute has multiple values of similar things in it. Realistically, we don't want that later on, but at the design stage, that's fine. Stored versus derived attributes. Back to date of birth. That's like my favorite example for this because it's the easiest one for everybody to understand because everybody has a date of birth, usually. Stored, you store the date of birth. Age, you don't store. Age is derived. At the design stage, cool, you can design in, like when you're doing the concept, conceptual side of it, you can have derived attributes. That's fine. No big worries. But we don't include it in the physical design in the end. When we're done, we take get rid of the composite attributes unless we really need them. Because a derived attribute is a value in the database that can be calculated using other data in the database. So we want to know how old someone is. How do you calculate how old someone is? Now minus date of birth tells you how old they are. Date math is terrible, but that's how you do it. Now minus date of birth, the difference between those two numbers is how old they are. Uh, one that's probably more common that you've experienced, 
I'm assuming everybody here has been to the grocery store at least once in their life. A grocery store. You gone to buy food? Never heard of it, eh? You go to the grocery store and you buy five pounds of bananas. It's leg week. Right? Five pounds of bananas because you want your protein. Your total is 79 cents times five is how much you're going to pay for the bananas. The line total is derived because we can calculate it based on quantity times price. We'll give you your line total. Now, big stores and chains will actually store these derived values for performance reason. Can you imagine if Amazon needed to recalculate the total of every order every single time they ran a report? No. But in other systems for a smaller volume, you don't store that stuff. Like you, Wikipedia is a great example. You pull up a Wikipedia page about a person, it'll always show their age. Do you think somebody's going through and updating those ages every day? No, they're calculating the age based on the value in the database. So the age is derived. And then we have identifier attributes. Um, there are attributes you could use as a primary key. They uniquely identify a row of data. Uh, normally, we try to stay away from those and we use, you know, sequences instead because even identifier attributes can change. Okay. So we got a table of data on the screen and we have a few things here. Um, we're going to be focusing on the required or optional side of it. Student ID is required. Student name is required. Everything down to their major. The major is optional because a student might register with a school, but not set their major until later. College isn't like university. Just, just saying. Right? You can sign up for university and be accepted in a program, but your major is not determined when you're signing up. Like you can sign up for a bachelor of computer science and then you can determine your major after your first semester once you know what you want to do. So in this case, the major is optional. Uh, simple versus composite. I, I covered this one already in detail. Uh, this slide just goes over that whole address thing. Um, So when we're diagramming um, an entity, there's a few ways to do it. And I will be talking about ERDs uh, next week. You can literally diagram it both ways as a simple attribute or as a composite where you have an attribute that breaks into more attributes if you want to get detailed. Often, a lot of people don't bother do the, the, the detailed one. Uh, but that's what they are. Uh, Multi-valued versus derived. Um, that's the skills. And they're using years employed as the uh, derived attribute. What's your start date? June 1st, 2000. How long have you been employed there? 23 years. That's derived. Who cares how long you've been there? You only care about when they started because then you can figure out how long they've been there. Okay. So defining attributes. You should state what the attribute is and possibly why it is important. Make it clear what it is, what is and is not included in the attributes value. So when you're doing the initial design and you're writing out a list of attributes for a table, um, before you even start diagramming, uh, there used to be a tech basic, I don't remember what it's called exactly, but essentially you'd create a document that lists all the known attributes and you'd literally describe each one. It's written in a way that someone who's not a database designer would understand what it means. So that when you go and meet with the client, you're able to give them a document and they can read and go, I understand, if you're lucky. So you make it clear what is is not included in attributes value. For example, you have an attribute called email. What's included in the email? 
don't be shy, an email address. What's not included in an email field? Anything that's not an email address. It's not going to hold the person's name. It's not going to hold the person's phone number. Aliases. Sometimes things have more than one name. Where I was working, we had this thing called a security bit. The issue was that all the product managers called it a feature bit. They were the same thing. So when we were redesigning the systems, we had to document that the fact that a feature bit's the same thing as a security bit. They're aliases of each other. Student versus learner. They're the same thing. At least as far as Algonquin's concerned. State the potential sources of values. Where does the data come from? If you don't know where the data is coming from, you have a problem. If you're designing something that nobody will ever be able to use, because if you don't know where the data is coming from, neither will they. If you can't say where the data comes from, you're done. You should specify whether it's required or optional. That just go, that's, goes without saying. Uh, min and max number of occurrences allowed. Um, that actually gets a little more complicated, and that's something we're going to talk about later for cardinality. Um, but essentially, the min and max number of occurrences allowed stand, means that you are um, brain. Do you have one or one or one, one or more, none? So a customer can exist without an order. So order might be none, could exist theoretically. Uh, you indicate relationships to other attributes. Um, An example would be, can a an order requires a customer number? You'd state that the fact customer number is coming from the customer kind of thing. Uh, you, you create your keys. You have your identifiers, an attribute, a combination thereof, simple versus composite. Um, when you're doing the initial design and you have not figured out if you're going to use uh, artificial keys, like sequences and stuff, uh, you'll probably have what's called candidate identifiers or candidate keys. You're going to say, I have this data. In this data, theoretically, I could use this column or combination of columns to uniquely identify, identify the data. Going back to that example where we're pulling in gigabytes of data every couple of days, you know, 12, 13, 14 columns, whatever it was, that identifies it. That's the candidate key they came with. They said, with that combination of columns, we can always guarantee we can find one row of data in this insanely huge database. That's a candidate identifier that became a primary key later. But at that point, when he was doing the initial design, it was a candidate. It was a potential. Whether it gets selected to be the key or not is the unknown. Um, yeah, I, we already talked about identifiers. We're going to skip that and that one. All right. so. Criteria for identifiers. You want to choose identifiers that will not change in value and cannot be null. Which leads us back to the whole real world identifier thing. Right, when we're looking at our candidate keys. Can you guarantee that that data will never change? Right? SIN numbers will change. Passport numbers can change. Email addresses definitely change. Phone numbers change. People's names change. Somebody gets married and they take the last name of their partner. Last name changes. Persons decide instead of being Amy, they're now Andy. Or some mathematical symbol. Names change. It's life. Names are not guaranteed. Therefore, those are not good candidate keys. You have to pick a value that will never be null. In theory, a cell phone number, there could be someone without a cell phone. It happens every semester. I have one or so in the group that don't have a cell phone. They just don't want to have a cell phone. They don't want to be contactable. They want to be like I was when I was in college, where I could just go missing and never be found again. Um, phone numbers theoretically could be null. They might have a home phone number, but not a cell. They could have a cell, but not a home phone number. 
They might have a phone number period, or they might not even have one. They might have one in another country and we can't handle that. So we need values that will not be null. We want to avoid intelligent identifiers that could change. I've pretty much explained what those are already. Stay away from names, addresses, phone numbers, that kind of thing. And if we have complex keys, substitute to new simple keys. Just makes life easier for everybody. All right, relationships. What are we doing for time? I'm just going to check how many slides are left. Oh, we're almost finished. No, we're not. Is this a good place to stop? Yes. But I don't think I can finish this today. Okay. And I don't want to finish halfway through a topic. Okay. So, um, last thing I want to do really quick, uh, I meant to do it earlier, is just go through the bright space shell for this course for you guys. Um, which will take me about five minutes, and that brings us to an hour and a half of enough brain melt. All right. You all know what Brightspace looks like. This is where you're going to see the announcements. Anyways, enough being facetious. Um, okay, under content, you'll see, I don't know how your other courses are organized. Uh, I have everything there. Um, literally week by week. The slide decks are there. Um, reading that I recommend for the week is there. Your lab is there. Like if it's week one, great. Go look at week one. That's the shit you got to do. Your week five, go look at week five. That's what you got to work on. Um, for those of you that are week, uh, week, weekly challenged, you can click on labs and all the labs are there. Uh, I am pretty sure I have published all the labs up till the break. So you're welcome to look ahead at the labs to see what's coming. Um, I don't recommend doing them unless you've already worked with databases before in the database design side of the deal, but they're there for you. Um, recordings. Obviously, there's nothing there right now. What's going to be under recordings? Links to the YouTube recording. Because Algonquin's media site is a flaming dumpster of garbage. Trying to be polite. Uh, I used to use it. I sounded like a Smurf because they re-encoded all the video. And they changed, they really compressed the audio side of it. And so I sounded like a Smurf. Um, and I swear it ran at 480p. The, um, so I'll be posting basically a link to YouTube here. So you want to watch it in bed on your phone because you're sick? Cool. That's that's great. Uh, course information is the usual thing you're going to find. Um, so here's the schedule. I said I was gonna, it's in Brightspace. So under course information, you'll find a little table with uh, a schedule. And it renders really like crap. So... Sections, uh, the lecture sections today, it shows it's Tuesday, 4 to 6 uh, in this room. Um, yeah. Unless the school tells you their school's closed. And I've been teaching it for 17 years, and I've seen the school close three times in 17 years. We don't close. They closed after the derecho two years ago. They closed after the tornadoes the year before. And there was one really bad snowstorm where they shut down because there was uh, about four centimeters of ice down. It was a bad storm. Unless the school has no power and it is not life-threatening in the sense of you will not die by stepping outside your house. School happens. Sorry. It is what it is. Now, as I said before, I don't take attendance in labs. You don't want to come to the lab. It's cool. If you want to not come tomorrow and come Thursday, 
the labs are all posted. You work on your lab. You are assigned work to do. You do the work yourself. Uh, I do have a caveat about lab one, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. Thank you for triggering that memory. Um, but these are the classrooms and the times I'm going to be at. So tomorrow I'm in CA. For those of you that don't know what CA is, it's across Woodruff Avenue. You know, that, that really modern design lead building that's terrible. It's like the worst building at the school behind B. Uh, then it's A133, that's like down around the corner. And then B319, third floor of B. Um, if you can't make it to your normally scheduled class, great. Come to another class if you need help. If you don't need help, you don't need to come to class. Uh, the CSI is there, listed by week, what roughly we should be learning and when things are happening. Um, and then we got, you know, the, the directives A and uh, 18 and 20, which is, you know, cheating and plagiarism. Uh, I think they updated it for Chat GPT. Congrats. Chat GPT can't design a database if it's life dependent on it. So good luck. It's not going to help you with your homework. I fed the, I fed it the labs. It failed everyone. It's not hard to write labs that Chat GPT can't do, or Bing Chat. They, they, it's not hard to do. Okay. Uh, professor information. My email address. I don't have an office. I have a space, and if you want to have a meeting in my office, you're welcome to sit with me and like eight other profs so everybody can listen to your problems. I'd rather, if you need to meet me personally in private, we'll do a Zoom call, or I will find an empty classroom, you know, close to that. But I work full time, so don't ask for like a 10 a.m. appointment. That's not going to happen. I have a job. It's just not going to happen. Okay. Um, lab one. <clears throat> You will notice there's a nice red thing at the top. I really wish they'd stop installing MariaDB at level one because it causes me problems at level two. We use MySQL Workbench as our design tool and our uh, database administration tool. Guess what doesn't work with MariaDB very well? The administrative tools for MySQL. MariaDB does not have a proper GUI. In theory, I could change it to use uh, PHP My Admin. <laughs> um, but then you'd still need to install a design tool that won't work with MariaDB. So uninstall MariaDB. Please make my life easier. Because if you install MySQL while you have MariaDB installed, MySQL is going to go on some other port. And then suddenly the instructions are going to get a little weird for you because you got to figure out the differences. And students from my experience are not good at figuring out the differences. MariaDB runs on port 3306. MySQL runs on port 3306. Can you run two things on the same port? No. <laughs> Therefore, what happens? When it installs, MySQL go to 3307, 08, 09, something else. Then you have to remember what the port is, especially for labs, uh, for the database backup lab, where you're doing stuff at the command line. And the user management lab. You're going to have a rough time if you're not running the same ports. Um, Mac users. Good luck. Nothing against the Max. It's good. I never used a Mac. If you're running Linux, hot damn, could I ever help you? Running Windows, cool. If you're having technical difficulties under Mac, I could take a stab at it. And I, you might have a functional Mac when we're done. Well, it's not that bad. I, it's a Unix-like operating system. I can get around. It's just things on Mac are a little weird. Like you install stuff by dragging and dropping. And then, you know, you click on it, and then you have to click on something else, and then go to permissions, turn it back on, and it keeps asking you for tapping your finger. 
as applicable. Um, it's just a little weird on Mac land. Yes, you can do it. It's great. All the instructions are written for Windows. Uh, I didn't even write most of these instructions. I'm just using them. <laughs> but it is, you're going to have to, you know, do the equivalent version of whatever Windows is, but for Mac. It's a good thing Macs are easy to use. It's too bad development software on Mac isn't. But I can help. So, uninstall MariaDB, especially Mac users. Especially Mac. That's actually because of the Mac users I put that there. The Windows users, we can usually work around it. The Mac users, get rid of Mar MariaDB because I've had a case where a student installed MySQL while well, they had MariaDB installed, and then they couldn't uninstall MariaDB anymore when they had problems. And I had to, like, do things to their computer, and their computer wasn't happy with me. I got it working, but it just wasn't a good time. Um, but yeah, labs are there. Lab one. Oh, it's so dry in here. Uh, lab one. Download the installer. For Mac, you're going to have to download the two pieces individually. They don't make a universal installer like they do for Windows. So you'll have to down, download MySQL server. MySQL Workbench is two separate tools. Install them separately. Congrats. It's easier because it's a Mac. <laughs> Windows. Uh, I've had cases where you get a weird error message partway through because it needs um, uh, prerequisites to be installed, like certain runtimes to be installed. And for some unknown reason, it just decides to not work because it's the first week of school and everybody else is downloading at the same time and the servers get overloaded. And then we get we're DDoSing Oracle. And so then they ban the school IP address. And it's a very specific example because I've witnessed it happen. Um, last semester, because the level one for CP, CET, and C, C, uh, CET and CPA all use MySQL, and we had 570 students doing the labs in the first week. It didn't go well, with plus every other school that's doing the exact same thing. Um, you go through the wizard, follow the instructions. You're going to submit screenshots, which is why. You don't need to come to lab. If the weather's crappy and you can't catch a bus, that's cool. Don't come to lab. You can come to the next day's lab. You can come to the next week's lab. I will not be covering new material in lab. So you don't need to worry about missing something new in lab because I'm going to be covering nothing new in lab. I am there to help you get through your labs. That's my job in lab. Lecture, I'm here to teach you. In lab, I'm here to help you. So if you're stuck, you don't understand something, lab is a great time to come in and ask for help. Because if it's anything like it was last summer, I'll have labs where I have one or two students show up. You can go to any of the others. Yeah. Yeah, I usually ask, wait a week before you start doing that because they're usually the first week, almost everybody shows up until they realize they don't need to show up. It takes, takes a little bit of time to process that I don't care if you come to class. Um, well, I care, but I don't care. It's hard to explain. It's, it's an interesting dichotomy in my head. Like, I care that you come if you're having problems. If you're not having problems and everything's good, I don't care. If that makes sense. So, yeah, I'll be here tomorrow because, well, I have to be here. And uh, yeah, so I'll be here in two classrooms from four to eight. So four to six, six to eight, I'll be in CA and then somewhere here um, for labs. Outside of that, if you think you can do the labs on your own, fantastic. Knock yourselves out, it's all on you. Anybody have any questions for me outside of being already entertained? Going once, going twice, going three times. Those on the bus, good luck. I'm walking home.